Okay, so just steps in this. One, go through the problem, identify what each of the value represents. Then two, figure out what your knowns, the three knowns, which one's the unknown, rearrange the formula so that you can rearrange the formula. Rearrange the formulas and so that you end up with the unknown all by itself. And the unknown has to be in the nominator. You can't solve it if it's one over the answer that you want to have. So you have to make sure that you do that. Then go ahead and plug them in. Double check that you're plugging them in in the right spots. And then just apply significant figures. Always go back to the numbers in the problem to do that. Okay? So... That's the gas laws. Then remember, we started talking about solids and liquids and how solids and liquids, because they come in contact with each other, that their attraction to each other creates what's known as intermolecular forces. So we talked about London forces and how like oils, gasoline, how they, because they're so neutral, because they share their electrons so equally, that they're those nonpolar molecules and those nonpolar molecules have the weakest of all of the attractive forces, right? So those London forces, these are the nonpolar molecules. So things like CH4, C2H6, okay? Nothing but carbon and hydrogen. So your fats, oils, lipids, those all fall into those London forces effect. Then the next level up, has polarity and a molecule that's polar now has at least one nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. Remember those ones in that upper right hand corner, they don't share equally and that creates polarity. And you really just have to look at the molecule. If you have lots of nitrogens, oxygens, fluorines, and chlorines distributed around the molecule like sugar, Remember, it's a polyalcohol, so sugars have lots of alcohols. Then those, that's why sugar is polar and mixes with water. But then the third one we talked about is how if you have a molecule that has a nitrogen and a hydrogen or a molecule that has an oxygen with a hydrogen, then there is this attraction that occurs that creates what's known as hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is with a polar molecule, but it's a special kind of attraction that's much stronger than just dipole-dipole because there's this attraction that oxygens will have for other hydrogens of other molecules. And it creates a bond. It's a weak bond, but it creates a bond nonetheless. So that's kind of where we stopped last time, is listing and talking about these hydrogen bonds and how water has these characteristics. So one of the things that I was talking about was how water has this, what's known as surface tension. Water, because it's every water molecule wants to form up to four hydrogen bonds. So the electrons of the oxygen are attracted to hydrogens of other water molecules. The hydrogens of the, the hydrogen of the water molecules, there's two of them. They want to form hydrogen bonds with other oxygens in a water molecule of other water molecules. And that actually creates a surface on water that allows like a little water bug to float. So I brought you a beaker. This just has water in it. So you've got two little metal pieces on your lab, on the, on the desktop. The first one looks like this. So this one's actually the holder. The second one, sorry, I was to The second one is actually a unfolded paper clip. So what I want you to do is see if you can float it, okay? So just like the surface, the surface tension that holds this water bug up, this surface tension on this water is actually enough to be able to float this paper clip. So you see that you have a little flat paper clip. This one I consider like the holder. So what you have to do is you have to put your paper clip on the little holder and then slowly pick it up and lower it down into the water and you'll see that the little paper clip will actually float. 
you need to do it nice and slow. Kind of like stand the little paper clip holder up. And that way if you look down on it, you can actually see it creates almost like a little dimpling on the surface of the water. Mm -hmm. All the way under and then slowly come out and around. Mm -hmm. All right, so when you look at it, mm -hmm. so go straight down. Nope. Floating? Did you float yours? Okay. Can you see that? Can you see how there's almost like a little dimpling? Oh, you're like, you can't have a shaky hand. You gotta have like a really steady hand to drop it down. But in theory, you really, you can even float a dime this way. You can, because it doesn't weigh that much. It's like, has enough surface that it'll actually sit on the top. So if you've ever water skied, if you've ever skipped a rock, the whole reason that rocks will skip over the surface of the water is because water has this surface tension. So then remember I told you how water, because of this surface tension, it wants to cling together. It wants to form droplets. Well, if we add surfactant, that's how we break up that surface tension. So remember I was telling you about premature infants. So premature infants, they take a breath but their little airways are so small, the moisture inside of the airways want to pull closed every time they exhale and it causes their lungs to like completely collapse. So every time they take a breath, they're actually like pulling their little airways open again. So I told you that surfactant is a lot like soap. So I'm not gonna do this to everybody's, but I'll do this one to yours. So I have just a single drop, like a really, really tiny drop of soap just on this Q-tip. Wiggle it down and let it dissolve. Usually. And this one does. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it's still. You need to get enough soap. So usually as soon as it breaks the surface tension, I get, I didn't think I would need, but a teeny tiny amount. Or maybe it's because it's the liquid soap. Shoots itself? Hmm? Is it going to shoot itself? Mm -mm. No, what it does is it breaks the surface tension in the, um... Oh, that's what those are. That's never happened before. Hmm? Put a glob. You think it has to be a glob? I don't know. I don't think it should have to be a whole lot. <laughs> I don't want it to hit it. There. Oh, when it broke it to go uh, down. Huh? I've seen it. So that's what it so what it does is when you add soap, that actually breaks down that cohesiveness and it'll allow then it won't it then the surface tension gets broken and it doesn't have enough to be able to hold it up. Did you get yours back on? Let's see, I'm gonna see if I can. Versus yours went down. See, it should. Like that. I don't know what's oh, up with yours. Did you see it when I hit it? Did you see it like oh, it went to the exact opposite side of the beaker? Did you get yours to float? Is this distilled water? Mm -hmm. No, it's just tap water. It works on tap water. Mm -hmm. The kicker is, now I have soap on my fingers. The kicker is, is getting it so it's completely like balanced on the little holder. Now watch. Look, if I stick this right here, do you see what it did? Do you see how it like went? So normally that I don't know why yours didn't work. <laughs> like 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 that. But usually I get just a little bit of soap. And so soap acts like that surfactant that they spray in baby lungs. And now all it does is it actually helps to break down that attraction that the water molecules have for each other. So we'll talk about soap again. 
in a couple of slides, we just have to finish the last two types of intermolecular forces. So there's not a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of polar molecules that dissolve that can also interact with water and have this surface tension or have this hydrogen bonding. The one that's kind of the big kicker is to remember that like lipids don't. Fats, oils, greases, anything that's nonpolar is not going to interact with water and it's going to end up like separating. Okay. Fourth one, right? So we have London forces, which is just the nonpolar stuff. Then we have dipole, dipole, which is just basic polarity. If there's a hydrogen on an oxygen or a nitrogen, then you can have hydrogen bonding. But even a stronger than that is what happens when salts get put in water. So ion dipole is, an ion is really salt, and dipole is talking about water. So if you take a crystal of salt and you drop it into water, the sodium ions are attracted to the slight negative part of the water. The chloride ions are attracted to the slight positive side. So because they're similar, not exact, but they're similar, this attraction allows salts to dissolve when salts actually themselves have a really high intermolecular attraction. But because they can interact with the water molecule, they can split up into ions. So this is why when you take sodium chloride, which is a solid, and you put it in water, it splits into sodium ions that are aqueous and chloride ions that are aqueous as well. So it allows them to separate. They don't have to stay together. But AQ, remember, means that they're just floating in water. So that's why you have sodium ions instead of sodium atoms in the body. Chloride ions instead of chlorine atoms. They always exist as those ions, but they're strong enough. There's a strong enough attraction to the water molecules that they'll dissolve. So I always think of ion dipole, just think of like salt in water. So if you see any kind of salt in water, then it's an ion dipole attraction. And then the last one. So here's really what, I, what ionic compounds do. If you think of sodium chloride, if you look at a, like just salt in the salt shaker, they exist as crystals. The reason that they exist as crystals is because one sodium ion comes up against another, uh, another or one sodium chloride group comes up to another sodium chloride group and it'll automatically orient itself. So if you look at this image, see that everywhere that there's a chlorine, the sodium is right around it. So there's a chlorine and there's a sodium, there's a chlorine here. So there's like a, wherever there's a sodium, there's a chlorine above, below, left, right, and front and back. So sort of like every sodium gets surrounded by a chlorine and every chlorine gets surrounded by sodium. And so that creates this positive, negative, positive, negative charged structure that is really very, very stable. So salts, the melting point is about 1800 degrees Celsius. So you would have to heat sodium chloride to about 1,800 degrees Celsius to get it to melt because it's so stable in this crystalline structure. So remember, water, water melts at zero degrees Celsius. So it's a really high melting point for these solids. So this is the most stable. The most stable attraction between molecules is the, the attraction that you find with salts. So if you're going to look at these, these are kind of like five examples going from weakest to strongest. So the first one, this is the London force. London forces you can identify because you see nothing but carbon and hydrogen. Right, so these are like your fuels, the fuels, the oils, the waxes, greases. You 
remember that these, they don't interact with water. But now when you look at the second one, if you see one, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, if you see one of those on a small molecule, then you know it's going to be a polar molecule like this one. So this is CH3, CH2, COH. That double bond to oxygen means that this side becomes slightly negative. So over on this side, it becomes slightly positive. So this is your polar molecules. So if you have aldehydes, if you have ketones, remembering those, those structures, if you have even an ether, esters, having those oxygens, or even in some of the um, like amines and amides, it really just depends on if any of those have a hydrogen on it. None of those do. Aldehydes, ketones, ethers, esters, those would always be dipole, dipole. Much stronger attraction here than what you see with those London forces. The third one, the one in the middle, is if you see an oxygen with a hydrogen or a nitrogen with a hydrogen, if you see this in a molecule, then you know that that molecule can hydrogen bond. Sugars do this. Water does this. This is what holds together the, the strands of DNA, hydrogen bonding. So this is much stronger than just being polar. They say that a hydrogen bond is only 10% as strong as a covalent bond, but you typically have lots of them. So that's where it ends up making a big difference. To recognize the fourth one, if you see what looks like a salt, it's a metal and a non-metal in water, then you know that that is going to be the ion dipole. Some kind of salt in water, indicating that that salt dissolves, mixes in with the water and becomes aqueous. And that attraction keeps it completely dissolved. And then the strongest are just the salts by themselves. So if you have a compound of iron oxide, remember that salts are metals and non-metals, so you can identify if it's a metal and a non-metal, that's going to be ionic. So those are kind of like the things to look for. So we'll do this one. So you look at this one, there's four of them. One, two, three, four, yeah, five of them, sorry. There's five of them. So use those criteria and you tell me what is the strongest intermolecular force that is creating attraction for these molecules. So what would you say with the first one? Look back at the five. Mm -hmm. So remember, so back looking back here, London is the weakest, ionic is the strongest. So you go through each one to see what criteria does it have. The strongest intermolecular force with this one is what? Mm-hmm. 
And it's because there's a chlorine. Right? So remember I said if there's dipole, dipole, it is going to have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. If you see one of those and it's not a great big molecule, then it's going to be polar, and that's the dipole, dipole. How about the next one? London. Mm -hmm. Because you notice that with this one, there's nothing but carbons and hydrogen. So London forces are the strongest. Carbons and hydrogen only is going to be London forces. What about the next one, Al2O3? That's ionic. Right? Metal and a non-metal. What about this one? CH3OH. Hydrogen bonding. Mm -hmm. So this would be hydrogen bonding is the strongest. And the kicker with this is look for an OH or an NH. If you see a nitrogen or an oxygen with a hydrogen, it's going to hydrogen bond. And then the last one, Na2SO4 in water. This one's ion dipole because there's your metal and non-metal. Remember, the sulfate is the polyatomic ion, so it's an ionic compound in water. So that's an ion dipole, some kind of salt in water. So those are sort of like the what you're looking for with each one. Would it ever have like two elements in water, but it's not ion? No, pretty much. For this one, if you see something in water, it's going to be like the metal and the non-metal is what you look at when you see it. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll leave those. There's one, two, three, four, five, six here, but I will do those ones next time. So we're not really going to talk about like how it affects their boiling point and everything like that, but... The kicker to remember, and we've really talked about this already in chapter three, is this idea of like dissolves like. Polar things mix with polar things. Nonpolar things mix with nonpolar things. So this rule, and there is a term that they bring into play. They talk about hydrophilic. What is hydrophilic? Hydro means water, water and philic means attracted to or loving. So hydrophilic is water loving. Things that are water loving are the polar molecules and ionic molecules. They like to mix with water because they have a slight charge or an actual charge and they have an easier time interacting. Why salt mixes with water? Why sugar dissolves in your coffee? But hydrophobic Phobia, having a phobia means you have a fear, right? So some people have a phobia for spiders, like they're just scared of them. So remember, think phobic means being afraid of or fearing. So hydrophobic is water fearing. They say water hating. I don't really think of it that way. I think of it as being like water fearing. That is going to be the nonpolar molecules, so your fats, your oils, the greases and waxes, those are the hydrophobic. Those are the ones that only have London forces. And so literally they just get excluded. It's not that they like, like try to get as far away as possible, but if you take oil and vinegar and you shake it up, you will see that it almost looks like the oil droplets get pushed out of the way. The water molecules in the vinegar, they're polar. They hydrogen bond. They want to mix together, and so they will just exclude the nonpolar, the oily material. So you'll just see like these droplets just kind of get pushed out of the vinegar and settle back up to the top. So it's not that they like try to get like climb out of the bottle. They sit on top, and it's really that they're more like pushed out of the way because water 
and vinegar can hydrogen bond and that's a much stronger attraction. So that's really why you have that separation that occurs. Molecules that have similar polar polarities are gonna interact. Those that are on opposite, that are polar and nonpolar, they don't mix at all. So this becomes a bit of a challenge. If you get oil on your hands and you rinse them in water, the oil doesn't come off because oil is nonpolar and water is polar. So they don't mix. And so this is where you need to have amphipathic compounds. This is what soap is. So soap is a molecule that has some polar characteristics and some nonpolar characteristics. So when you see the word amphi, amphi means both. So it means that it's both polar and nonpolar. So when you look at this side, when you look at this side of a molecule where you see oxygens, oxygens with hydrogen, right? So this is going to have the ability to do dipole-dipole, but it's also going to have the ability to hydrogen bond. Very characteristic, polar. But the other part of the molecule is nothing but carbons. CH2, 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 lots of carbons and hydrogen. So remember, this is how fatty acids are. Right, long carbon chain. So this is the nonpolar region. And so only London forces come into play. But because fatty acids have 12 to 24 carbons in length, Though that really takes precedence. Even though there's a carboxylic acid on one side, it can't counter all those carbons in the chain. So that's why your fatty acids are nonpolar. Even though on one end they've got a carboxylic acid group, this is really long, the long carbon chain kind of like overcomes any polar nature that fatty acid would have. So what you do is you take and make soap out of fatty acids Soaps, instead of having a carboxylic acid group, soaps have an ionic compound on the end. It becomes what they call a carboxylate. So do you see that it has a charge? So if it has a charge, now it's ionic. And in terms of intermolecular forces, this is the strongest of the intermolecular forces. So now this side ends up being very hydrophilic. They call it the head because it kind of looks like the head. Whereas they say that this long carbon chain is the tail, that's the hydrophobic area. So this is how we made soap in lab. It was, we started with a fat or an oil we added sodium hydroxide, and sodium hydroxide broke the fat and oil into fatty acid chains and created that charged end. Because remember, sodium hydroxide is like lye, so it was corrosive. It has the ability to like chop those, those large fat molecules, breaking them off, and then forming that ionic compound on the end. So this sort of shows, that, remember that's the skeletal structure. The middle one kind of shows you the balls and sticks. And then the one on the end is how they most commonly will draw a soap molecule, trying to show that it's, hydro, that it's hydrophilic and hydrophobic, that it has this amphipathic characteristic. So when you go to wash your hands, what's the first thing that you always do? Wet them. Mm -hmm. So hand washing, one, you wet your hands. If you put soap on your hands and it's dry, if you've got oil on your hands and you have beer dry, if your, your hands are like there's no water on them and you put soap and mix it, the soap molecules are just going to form almost feels like almost like a paste, right? It feels just thick. It doesn't mix very well. And so you're like, 
unless you put water on, soap does not do this. So one, you've got to wet your hands. So you start off with water, then you add soap. And we did this with those little watch glasses when we tested like the cleaning effectiveness in lab. We started off, they put grease on the watch glasses, then they put a bit of soap on the, and added water and then mixed it. So for like a full minute, you like swirled it and mixed it and rubbed it all over the greasy surface of the little watch glass and then rinsed it, okay? So you add the soap. As soon as you add soap to that water, what part of the soap molecule wants to interact with water? The little round head or the long tail? The head. Mm -hmm. So remember that this, this is the polar head. So the polar head wants to interact with water, but the nonpolar tail does not. Just like the oil and vinegar, the oil wants to separate away from the water and vinegar. Same thing here. So what the soap molecule does, do you notice how the soap molecule kind of looks like a little wedge, more like a little triangle shape? So because of this, these fit very easily and begin to form what's called a sphere, right? So it starts to form this round structure. This round structure, its technical name, it's called a micelle. It's really just the technical name for how soap molecules form a sphere in water. So you wet your hands, you add your soap, and then you begin to rub. My cells begin to form, but it takes five to 10 seconds. So this, wet your hands, get a bit of soap and start doing this. So in this five to 10 seconds of this initial rubbing, you're making millions of these micelles. If you remember on the watch glass, it started getting milky and cloudy, the, the liquid. So it went from being clear with just soap flakes in it. And it's, as the soap starts to dissolve, it started getting milky. The reason it gets like that is that's because you have those micelles. And there's millions of them microscopic floating in this soapy water. So now if you have any grease or oil on your hands, where will the grease and oil be attracted to, the outside or the inside? The inside, because the inside's nonpolar, just like the grease and the oil is. So any kind of oil, any kind of grease, any sticky, waxy bacteria surfaces, so bacteria are pretty cool, they're pretty smart, like a lot of them actually have like a oily surface which prevents them from easily getting just washed away when they come in contact with water. So they can stick to surfaces, but when they come in contact with soap, that's going to pull them into the micelle. So this is why Rubbing five to 10 more seconds will lift oil, grease, bacteria, things that are nonpolar off of the skin surface. So one, got to do this is this is why they always say like hand washing should last the actual rubbing should last 15 to 20 seconds is because that's really what you're trying to do you're trying to make my cells and then give time for the grease and the oil to get pulled off of the skin surface and pulled into the surface of the my cell and then what do you do at the end rinse mm -hmm. when you rinse your hands the grease and the oil has been lifted from the skin surface and it all ends up rinsing down the drain. So that will rinse all of those materials, including the soap molecules and the micelles, all get rinsed off. So it's sort of the reason why hand washing, rubbing is part of it too. So the whole, the whole physical rubbing 
also helps to loosen, helps to make sure that the micelles really penetrate through the top layers of skin and help to dissolve anything that's nonpolar off of those surfaces. So hand sanitizer just, it actually like dehydrates and kills microscopic organisms, but then they're still on your hands. They're dead, but they're still there. So it doesn't actually like get rid of them because what are you doing to get rid of them? You're just rubbing it on your hands and then going off on your merry way. So now you got a whole bunch of like dead bacteria on your hands. <laughs> Which is why I like, well, it's better than living bacteria, I guess, <laughs> but it's really not a good substitute for hand washing because you still may have debris, dirt, grime, and such on your hands. So that's really the only difference. So because soaps have the ability to do this, because they have this ability to mix things, they call them emulsifiers. So when you hear that name, just know that an emulsifier is something that helps to mix things that are polar and things that are nonpolar. It'll let them be mixed and stay mixed in a solution. So it's just another term that you might see. So then on to the last one. The last one. So there is a molecule that your cells need that look a lot like soap. These are phospholipids. So phospholipids, they're special because they make the barrier of your cell membranes. So when you look at your body cells, all of your cells have an outside cover and the majority of them are made of, or the majority of the components in your cell membranes are phospholipids. So phospholipids, like they show this first picture, sort of shows like the skeletal structure, then underneath gives you the little cartoon version. But if you look at the skeletal structure, do you see the long carbon chains? So that's a lot like regular fats and oils. Remember those are always triglycerides? Well, this has two long fatty acid chains. One of them is saturated, the one at the very top. The other one's a mono unsaturated because it's got that double bond. See how it makes that bend in the molecule? But that whole kind of light green area, that's the nonpolar part. But the other side of the molecule, as you start to look, you see oxygens, four oxygens, Here's more oxygens. Here's a charge that is a phosphate group, which has a negative charge. Then there's actually a nitrogen group that has a positive charge. So we've got two areas of ionic characteristic as well as oxygens scattered about. So this whole piece right here this whole piece is now much more hydrophilic. So between the oxygens, the charged nitrogen, the charged phosphate group, so a nitrogen with an actual charge, the phosphate, and also the fact that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight oxygens, all of those contribute to this like polar hydrophilic side. So that's the polar head. Just like we have in the soap. Except the soap has only one fatty acid tail. This has two. So instead of looking kind of like a wedge, do you see how this has more kind of a rectangular shape? Whereas with the soap, because it only had a single tail, it looked a little more wedge-like. Having two tails prevents a phospholipid from forming a micelle. So phospholipids are kind of like too, too long, too rectangular to be able to form a micelle. So if you take phospholipids and you put them in water, this is what they do. So phospholipids 
will form what's known as a bilayer. So see how they have this rectangular shape compared to soap? So the soap molecule look like this. Phospholipids have more of a rectangular kind of arrangement, so they don't form a micelle. They'll form what's known as a bilayer. So bi means two. So a bilayer is like a double layer. The outside of the, the outside surface and the inside surface of this layer are what? Hydrophilic or hydrophobic? This part. Hydrophilic, right? The heads. So those heads are all hydrophilic. Both surfaces both here on the inside and the outside of the cell are hydrophilic surfaces, so they like to interact with water. But the inside layer, so you can almost think of it as being kind of like a sandwich, right? So the, out, the bread is like the outside layers, and so those are the hydrophilic surfaces, so those want to interact with the watery environment inside of the cell and outside of the cell. But then I got this in the middle. This whole middle part is where the tails are, and this part is hydrophobic. And this does not want to interact with water. In fact, this is going to prevent things that are watery or salt from being able to just pass through. So if you have water out here, it can come and interact, but it can't pass. I think of that phospholipid layer. This creates a barrier. It is a polar ionic barrier. Salt can't pass through easily. Water can't pass through easily. Sugars, remember glucose, remember I told you glucose has to have insulin in order for cells to like open up the doors or the gates and pull glucose in? That's because glucose is polar. Glucose has lots of those alcohols and so it dissolves in water. Anything that's dissolved in water is not going to freely pass through. So sugar bounces off. Water bounces off. Salts, so like sodium ions, bounce off. They're all going to end up being pushed. They're not going to be allowed to pass through. But this is not a bad thing because this helps to protect the cell. Because you, if things freely moved in or out of the cell, the cell would not be able to control what's going on inside. It would be more apt to be infected. It would be more apt to be under attack. Things would not... have what they call this semi-permeable membrane. So there's a cell. So here's your cell. So the cell, the entire cover on the cell is this phospholipid membrane. So it's the one there. So you see it like encircled by green. But now if we blow it up, all the green part up here, this is the phospholipid bilayer. And that there's really three parts to the cell membrane. So the phospholipids is the number one component. And it's big job, it's a barrier. So the parts are components to the cell membrane. The second one. So you see these blue things, right? They look kind of like bubbles, circles. Most of these are proteins. So the proteins, they can be found either on one or the other side of the membrane, or they might be going all the way through. So do you see there's two different kinds of proteins that are identified here? There's integral
So integral proteins are the ones that look like they go all the way through the membrane. Integral proteins, their big job is they're going to act like a channel. They're the doors. The way that glucose gets into the cell is through a channel. So they're going to carry specific molecules in or out of the cell. And that's really the biggest job. So there's actually glucose channels. There's channels that open up and they let glucose go from the, from the blood from outside of the cell and go in to where it's at from high to low concentration. But they're very specific. There's salt channels. So there are channels that allow sodium to go in, potassium to go in or out, calcium, magnesium, the different types of salts that are found. There are specific channels for proteins. There are specific channels for vitamins. So you have like these special doors and they're specific to certain molecules. Any molecule that's polar or ionic has to enter through a channel. In fact, there are even channels just for water. So water can go in or out of the cell through a channel because it's polar. It can't just pass through the phospholipid barrier. The other kind of protein that you see, they're listed as peripheral. Peripheral proteins are on one side or the other. So you can see in this one, this example, like find the peripheral protein in the model. And you see where it looks like it's stuck to one side. It doesn't go all the way through. So peripheral proteins, these proteins may actually, they may be enzymes that are embedded or anchored onto the side of the cell membrane. They might be receptors. So some of them are what like hold, they're reaching out for the insulin receptor. So it's a receptor that sticks out of the cell and it binds to insulin that comes along, which then tells the channel to open. So they can act as they can be a receptor or they might be an enzyme. There are some proteins. Remember when we were talking about the ABO blood group types? So remember I said that that means like the sugars that are on the surface of the blood cell, which marks them as A, B, A, B, or O. Then we were talking about RH, and I told you that's a protein that's found on the surface of red blood cells that can cause an issue with pregnancy with mothers that are RH negative. So do you see those funny looking things? They look like little sticks hanging off up here. There's carbohydrates. So carbohydrates can be anchored to proteins that then act as cell identification markers. So think about like your ABO blood group types. Think about like the RH proteins. Those are typically peripheral. So those are usually on one side or the other side, usually like sticking off the outside of the cell because they mark the cell as part of you. So you have like a whole pattern of proteins that are on the surface of all of your body cells that mark them as part of you. So that's really the job of peripheral proteins. So the last one, so we saw the green, all the little green phospholipid bilayer, all the blue, all the proteins, and might have carbohydrates on them. The last one, see the yellow? The third thing, the third component, that is cholesterol. See it right here. So cholesterol looks kind of like this little yellow bean, kind of like stuck in the membrane. So the, that's the third major component that we're going to talk about. And that really finishes up to finish up all of chapter seven. So cholesterol. So I've got integral proteins, peripheral proteins, the phospholipid membrane. 
this is what cholesterol, it's, it's what they call a steroid. So when have you taken steroids? Hopefully not to bulk up. <laughs> when have you taken steroids? Okay, like, so you have this terrible cold infection and you're like, I just can't kick it. I've been sick for the last two weeks. And so they'll give you a shot <laughs> and they're like, okay, I saw you med draw. And you're like, and you go home and you're like, oh, I feel so much better already. <laughs> next, day, next day you're like, why didn't I go three days ago? Right? <laughs> the sensation, steroids boost the return to normal. So if you take steroids, those are typically steroid hormones. Well, steroids, those steroids look very similar to cholesterol. So steroids all have this basic pattern. They all have a set of four rings. Three of them are six-membered rings. One of them is a five-membered ring, and they're all like interconnected. So they have this sort of shape. Examples, so steroids, cholesterol is a steroid, but so are your stress hormones. Cortisol is a steroid, so are your sex hormones. Estrogen, testosterone, steroids, okay? And that, so if we look at their structure, here's what cholesterol looks like. So see the four rings? that are kind of highlighted in yellow. Then they've got a skeletal structure coming up, but notice that's nothing but carbon and hydrogen. So if I was just looking at this, would you say that that's polar or nonpolar? The part that I circled. The part that I circled, is it polar or nonpolar? Non, because it's nothing but carbon and hydrogen, right? So it's just like looking at a skeletal structure. So this part, this is the yellow bean part that you see in the cell membrane. So see the yellow part? When you look back at, your, at the cell membrane, see that yellow sort of bean look shape? That's that part that I circled. It's nonpolar, so it fits into the phospholipid barrier because that whole center area is where those nonpolar tails are, the fatty acid tails. So they don't want to interact with water, but cholesterol fits in there just fine. But when you look at it, do you see that there's this little like black piece that sticks up? It kind of looks almost like this little black line sticking up. See this one, it's actually sticking down. So it's like right there. Coming up off of this one, see this little black line sticking up? Here's another one, and then this one, this one. Those are the part I didn't circle, because that in alcohol. And so it actually helps orient the cholesterol molecule so that they always stay up and down. So the cholesterol molecule, the little OH, sticks or pursuit, um, protrudes out the surface of the membrane and all the rest of it fits down into that phospholipid barrier. Why? It helps to make the membrane more stable. We are warm-blooded animals. Warm-blooded animals make cholesterol because since we're warm-blooded, our body temperature is at 98.6. Cows are a little bit higher. They're at about 100.4. So body temperatures are higher, that means that this membrane being hydrophobic would be much more greasy, oily, and much more fluid. You need to make sure that the membrane is strong enough so that it doesn't just fall apart. So cholesterol actually helps make your membranes a little more rigid, a little stronger, much better for warm-blooded animals. And here's the other rule, only animals make cholesterol. Only animals, plants do not make cholesterol. So like when you see the peanut butter that says cholesterol free, duh, okay, <laughs> okay. Salad, cholesterol free. <laughs> Anything from a plant, no cholesterol. <laughs> Only animals make cholesterol, which is like so funny when you see like cereal, cholesterol free. It all comes from a plant. I hope it's cholesterol free. Otherwise, they'd be throwing up like some animal fat up in there. <laughs> all right. So only animals make cholesterol. And it's because 
Animals are warm-blooded. Plants are not. <laughs> Plants don't have to have more rigidity to their cell membrane. They have cellulose for that. They have the ability to make like really rigid cell wall membranes. So it's, they don't have that need. Here's another interesting one. Cholesterol, you can take cholesterol and you can use it to make stress hormones. The cortisol comes out of the adrenal glands. Your epinephrine, norepinephrine, the the fight or flight kind of response, the real intense, stressful life. <laughs> but you can also take cholesterol and you can make estrogen out of it, which is a stradiol. Estrogen's actually a bunch of hormones. That's a generic name. So there's about four or five different estrogen molecules, but this is the most common one. And then there's testosterone. Male hormones, female hormones. What blows me away is how similar they look. Look at testosterone and estradiol. Not very much difference. Like, so testosterone's got that extra methyl group and the bonding arrangement's a little different. There's a double bond oxygen versus an alcohol group, but really not a whole lot of difference, just a little bit of bonding difference. But think about like these two, depending on if you're an XX or an XY, that will determine which of these hormones is made and that will guide all the sexual development and how much different males and females are. And it's that, those are the primary sex hormones, which is pretty amazing to me when you think like, they look almost exactly the same. I would have thought like before I knew this, I thought that they look, must have looked really different. No. <laughs> and you can actually, in from the cholesterol you eat, you can make testosterone, you can make estrogen. Males and females make both. Males just make more testosterone than estrogen. Females make more estrogen than testosterone. But both genders make both. And you can use cholesterol in order to make those stress hormones. So you actually use cholesterol. Cholesterol stabilizes the cell membrane and it's used to make these other hormones. So when you go to the doctors and they talk about your cholesterol, I think I'll be okay. When they talk about your cholesterol, the big kicker is you always want your cholesterol to be under 200. And that's what they call your total cholesterol. So you go in, they draw blood, they filter out the cholesterol and do the measurements. Total cholesterol should be under 200. And they never talk about units, but the units are still just like blood, like blood sugar. It's milligrams of cholesterol per deciliter of blood. And that's like considered like the blue book value. <laughs> That's like saying like, there, you're perfect. If your cholesterol is 180, your cholesterol is 160, your cholesterol is 150, whatever, as long as it's under 200. So they can take this though, and they can split it up. Cholesterol is not polar, right? So cholesterol does not dissolve in water. So cholesterol cannot just float through the blood. If it can't mix with water, it cannot free float through the blood. So it actually has carriers. So things that are nonpolar, things that are hydrophobic, they have to have kind of like soap. So remember I told you that soap makes the micelle? Well, there are carriers that float through the body that are like micelles, but they carry fat and cholesterol because fat and cholesterol cannot just freely float. They would like stick to a blood vessel just like grease on your hands. And then you'd end up with lots of challenges. So instead, there's two kinds of carriers. You have what are called high density lipoproteins, HDL, and you have low density lipoproteins, LDL. High density lipoproteins, these transport fats and cholesterol to a destination. So if you have these in your blood, they're taking cholesterol from your liver to your fat cells or from your liver to your body cells or from your liver to your adrenal glands or to your sex organs so that you can use it to make the hormones that you need. So I always think of it being as transporting. These actually are called, they hold on to cholesterol tightly.
They don't let go. That's why this is called your good cholesterol. Not bad. This is the good cholesterol. It's good because it's taking cholesterol where it needs to go in the body. So it's a transporter. Low density lipoproteins, your LDL, always has gotten the name or the rap that it's bad. It's your bad cholesterol because this is your circulating cholesterol. And this can actually release cholesterol and cause plaque buildup. So if you have a lot of LDL, here's a blood vessel. Oh, go back. So here's a blood vessel. If you have a lot of LDL, as it's passing through the blood vessel, some cholesterol might get dropped off and stick, just like grease sticks to your hands. Cholesterol will stick to the wall of the blood vessel. They call this plaque. High amounts of LDL increase your risk of plaque. So see the second picture? That's if you have a lot of plaque. What's that going to do to circulation? Yeah, so it's like if the tube's this big, but now I'm starting to build up plaque. Now it's really like the inside of my tube is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that high plaque buildup, this is gonna help cause a blockage to form. It'll decrease circulation. And if it's in your blood vessels that supply your heart, this puts you at risk of what? Mm -hmm. So if it completely blocks, this is why when they go do like stress tests, so somebody's like, I've been having chest pains, they go and they do an EKG and they're like, mm. so then they call back and they're like, okay, send them down. We want to do the, we want to look at the blood vessels on the heart. And they see that the, like when the heart's beating, you see like this blood starting to move and this little tiny trickle of blood passes through. That's because of plaque buildup. So in this vessel, you have so much plaque that it decreases blood flow, which means that the cells downstream are not getting oxygen and nutrients. So this can lead to a heart attack. If you have them build up here, so the carotid arteries, what can that lead to? You can have plaque build up in these big arteries. It can lead to a stroke. So if you completely block, then no blood is going to get to the brain, and that can lead to a stroke. So this is why going to the doctor and getting just general, the checkup, they draw blood, they run it through, and they look to see what is not just what is your total cholesterol, but what is your ratio. Optimally, you want more HDL than LDL. Higher HDL means that cholesterol is being used, that fats are being transported correctly through the body, and that it's not adding to plaque. High levels of LDL though, especially if you have a family history, like so if you have anybody in the family that has hypertension, anybody in the family that's had a stroke or a heart attack, now you're at much higher risk. And so those end up playing factors. So if your cholesterol is over 200, so you go to the doctor, cholesterol is over 200. First thing you could do is you can try to decrease your cholesterol intake. So you can decrease the amount of animal fat that you ingest. And this is the list in order. Beef has the most because they have the highest body temperature. So you cut out red meat. Pork is second. So you decrease the amount of pork chops, bacon, <laughs> all the things that you like in your life, <laughs> okay? Chicken and fish have the lowest. Chickens actually have a lower body temperature than cows do, which means they have less cholesterol. And fish come from the ocean, okay? So I'm not talking about like, well, freshwater fish, they still have less cholesterol, but like salmon, those, 
tuna, those are going to have a lot lower cholesterol because the ocean is cold. So they don't have to have as much cholesterol because their body temperature is lower. So this is the most, this has the least. So you can cut back on your animal fat, animal meat intake, and that can help in cholesterol levels, especially if you're at risk. Second thing you can do, you can exercise because they have shown exercising increases the need for fat use as energy. So your HDL numbers will go up and your LDL numbers will go down. And they have shown that that can actually help to reduce the amount of plaque on blood vessel walls. So if you can increase your HDL, lowering your LDL through exercise, that can actually improve the, the status, the amount of space through those blood vessels. But if you have the risk factors of high cholesterol, high blood pressure, or this history, family history of heart disease, then the doctor may say you need to be on a statin. So a statin is something like Crestor, Lipitor. There's a lot of them out there. And what these do is these actually decrease cholesterol production in the body because we are animals. <laughs> Only animals make cholesterol. You make cholesterol too. So you get cholesterol in your diet, but you also make it. And so the statins actually decrease cholesterol production by your liver. But if you're on a statin, you have to go have liver checks done every three to six months because statins can cause your liver to have be challenged, cause stress to the liver, and some people it can end up causing like major liver damage. So that's the, like, I know so many people, like my mother went, my mother, she's always my taste, my, my example, because like, she's very neurotic, but she, she goes to the doctor and the doctor's like, your, your cholesterol level's 210. I want you to take this statin. And I was like, mm. <laughs> well, mom, <laughs> maybe you could just try like just two days a week, just like cut out the red meat and the pork, like just have fish or just have chicken. Like try to cut back on the amount of high cholesterol you're ingesting and then do some laps in the house. Cause like, she's all about like, I can't be walking around out there. I'll fall down. So I'm like, but she has like, she can do laps in her house. And so I'm like, do laps in your house because exercise can improve it. So she was like, no, I'm just going to take this stat. And then like two weeks later, she's like, I feel terrible. <laughs> I was like, because for some people, like some of the statins cause leg cramps, terrible leg cramps. So there's other side effects. So those first two options, that's really the, the, the best way to try to lower cholesterol. But now I had a friend that he's Italian and his cholesterol was over 300. Okay. So like when you get to that, like there, yes, you end up having to take a statin. His father had a heart attack. He had the risk factors and his cholesterol had been high since he was like a teenager. This isn't something that like suddenly it becomes a problem and he's pretty active. So the cholesterol and exercise thing, because of genetics, because you make cholesterol, if it's genetically in your family and there's this risk of heart disease, then that's really like kind of like, the statins really are probably something that you need to seriously consider. But like just taking them to take them, not always the best thing in the world. Okay. All right. So that stops. That's the end of chapter seven. Can you tell us which ones to skip over? That way I don't do kind of study. I saved this too. So um, so remember, in terms of studying, because this is the take-home exam, you just have to make sure you have everything organized. Okay. So anything that I have like blocked out, then you, like that I have marked off as we went through. So topics in this chapter: gas laws, the intermolecular forces, and how things like identifying them, and then soap, and then the cell membrane and cholesterol is kind of another topic. So that's really like the major topics in chapter seven. Okay, so. You can get this, chapter seven, get the gas law um, dynamic study module done 
I think there's an intermolecular forces dynamic study module. I'm not 100% sure, but there you should have one due like this coming week. I think I pushed it back. So on Wednesday night, we will start chapter eight, which is all about solutions. And we're going to kind of do the same thing. There's a few things that I'm like, we're not going to talk about this one or that one, because I really want to try and make sure that we get the bulk of this material in before I give you your take home exam. Okay.